hello. Hello. Thanks for hanging out over the break. I saw lots and lots of emojis. Um, President Lincoln, it's not your boy, it's my boy, and it wasn't a massacre, okay? Um, he respected me for it. Uh, this stream is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, so definitely go download that trash app. Um, Skate Mom with the four bits, thanks for the bits. We love the bits. Those bits will go directly into our programming and will help our resident artists and help us, you know, continue to grow. Uh, we're here today with uh, loving co-host Jake Leach and our wonderful, intelligent, kind of like scary intelligent guest, Liz Dykeman. Um, so we're going to be entering into this uh, second portion of the show here where we talk with Liz about the work that she's doing and um, the perspective, the really unique and amazing perspective that she has. So welcome all back to the stream. Um, Liz, over the break, I was asking you to, you know, just just quickly and succinctly define who you are. Oh, uh, Lord. Um, that's like the serious <laughs> question i've had in a long time so ridiculous i'm sorry i i, I mean we we know things about you right um we know yeah, that can you repeat the question <laughs> <laughs> no no I, I i i just wanted to put you on the spot there um so we know from your uh your bio that you're data and research manager at the regional data alliance and you're co-founder of mm -hmm. um midwest artist projects services which is a nonprofit here. And you, in addition, if those two things weren't enough, you are writing, um, you're doing your PhD studies at UMSL uh, in political science. Yeah, these things are all true. Um, I'm trying to think what the sum of them is, <laughs> however. I mean, really, like, I think what you said earlier, like, I. I found myself like on a on a journey through the arts and culture sector, like really anchored here in St. Louis because this is where I live and work and, and love. And that my work as, you know, an arts administrator and a talent buyer and all of the other five thousand jobs I've had within the arts, from like doing marketing to like sweeping floors, mm -hmm. uh, more sweeping floors than, than anything else. <laughs> um is really that like I, I think that like it's been this like amazing journey of really asking questions and like these questions have have led to like other questions um, and they've led me to this place of really wanting to learn more about what I often see as like a practitioner um, mm -hmm. or being in the field. Um, like I said, you know, I just had really basic questions about like, why is it like this? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really led me to it led me to, you know, um, studying policy, which led me to politics. And I think I realized um, in the past, or I hate having to say this out loud, six years of graduate school, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, power is like the atom of political science. And I think in a lot of ways, policy as well. Um, and I really think that it's been an incredibly helpful lens for me to better understand like the arts and culture sector. Mm -hmm. um, power is you know implicitly in so many of our systems and ways we treat each other and ways we work together um that i think it really led me to um understanding things a little, like having a different lens and having now like a much more although i reject it in a lot of ways like i have now like the the academic background to speak to these things in different ways but like be honest i don't really care about the academy like i'm doing these things because i care about the community um and I hope that whatever academic work I'm doing, like, it always feeds back into the community. I don't want it to be, you know, research produced for the, for academics. Like, I want it to be research produced for the community. Like, I want to be able to answer questions or work with people to answer questions they have about our own arts community. Like, why are things the way they are? Mm -hmm. well, Anyone and, have any and questions? I <laughs> yeah first well, of all i want to i want to say thank you to skate mom for the 100 bits thanks for cheering oh, 100 bits today yes um i i also love too that like you're saying like you've swept the floors like you've gone to the the you know beer sloshed whatever basement shows you know and like that's that's the community that it starts not all art beer sloshed certainly but um you know just like you like I think part of the participation of like people who go into these spaces, uh, you would hope anyway, have certainly participated 
in those worlds as as a patron you know and and i think that like i think the best of us that go into spaces of like academia or places of nonprofit or power or whatever they may be uh we're really on the ground you know in the first place and i think that that gives the inherent street cred you know if if, if nothing that but then also truly the experience that uh can better like not only people take you seriously but then also it better informs the 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 future things that we're setting forth in the first place now is uh, no longer kids in a basement, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, you can't be a kid in the basement forever. I mean, like, you can. <laughs> I, There's always heart, that one I guy. Yeah. Be, oh, yeah, uh, there is also, always that guy. There's always the one talk about, guy. <laughs> talk about street cred. Can I point out there is a Chinook whiskey bottle over your shoulder? Okay, yes. Whoa. So, I, I, that was our little Easter egg. Uh, my mom, actually, I don't know if anyone caught that, brought that in uh, during the last segment while on air. I didn't want to announce it officially, but I did make it a... <laughs> Just to not set a precedent that we're interrupted. Okay, mom. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, the, shout out uh, to Denise. Have, shout out to Denise, uh, my dear yeah. mother and astrologer, who will be on Club Stars Line. Sorry, just dropped that in there. Anyway, uh, I thought I would have that on display for us. I thought it felt right for this episode. It's, it's like the devil on your shoulder. It feels good. It is. It's like let me. Let's or the see. angel. Or the angel. Yes. Well, can get it. we all know how I feel about whiskey. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um i want to i want to say really quickly too though something that i think i'm really interested in is starting to like deconstruct the power systems and narratives that we have within the arts community mm -hmm. um and to be able to have like for lack of a better word some of like the more technical abilities to be able to like answer questions and that's not to say that i am providing new answers to questions um but really more so grounding them in like data that i think unfortunately a lot of decision makers and people with power uh respect more than lived experience which is really sad and we can talk about that for like a very long time because i have lots of feelings about that um but you know i think like actually i think a really great example is you know i think it's also a way that a lot of institutions and systems sweep away real issues like if you um don't know that there's data out there or you don't know um that you can ask particular questions um essentially like in political science, we would call this something like, uh, there's a couple of different theories out there, but it's the idea that like people in power, systems in power are intentionally keeping information from you so you can't raise certain issues, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really interesting idea because frankly, I think it happens a lot in the arts. And I mean that like at every different system and institution. And I don't think it's, all the time I don't think it's intentional, but I do think it's a real, um, it's really built up over over time and over history like those are like what's become normative mm -hmm. um so you know i think a really good example is i think about financial inequality among arts nonprofits um i would talk about it about among artists but to be frank we don't even collect data on artists and that's because again i think that collecting that data means it's important means that you can answer questions means that you can you know produce research um, it happens, you know, every couple of years, we might have some sort of study on artists, but for the most part, you know, no one's really collecting that data and asking like, you know, what can we learn from this? Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the examples I, I'm, I'm thinking of right now in all of this is um, funding inequity among us. Um, and this has been kind of like a thing that's come up in the past, I don't know. I'm sorry, you cut out years. just briefly, funding inequity among? Arts nonprofits. Arts nonprofits, okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And, you know, it's a conversation that's happening a whole lot among practitioners. And I think it's just really starting to like happen very seriously um, among, among people who work at non arts nonprofits, among people who, you know, are patrons, you know, whatever it is, however they um, interact with them. But, you know, if we look at St. Louis, and if you don't mind pulling up, yeah, let's see. Slide number, I think we can start with slide number one. Um, you know, there is data out there if you are very deep in the weeds um, where you can start to look at um, how equitably, for lack of a better word, uh, funding is distributed among arts nonprofits. And so something I think about a lot um, is, is this equitable or is it not equitable? And why, and I think this is like the real question, do we not talk about this in the same way we would talk about inequity among individuals? Like wealth inequity is something that um, as, as citizens of the United States, 
uh, we have talked about more and more. Um, but I think, you know, that's become a lot more normative within that space, but like, why hasn't it become normative within, you know, the cultural sector? Mm -hmm. Um, because I think it's a very legitimate question. Um, and I think that it really makes us face, you know, the historical biases and cultural biases, um, that the sector has operated in for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can, you can really start to see, um, you know, I, I essentially replicated a study that was done for the entire nation and it was done twice. Essentially what the study found, and this is um, Holly Sidford and Alexis Franz, they're part of the Helicon Collaborative. But essentially what they found is like something like 60% um, of all like charitable contributions go to something like 3% of all organizations. Mm. And then, you know, the other 97% of organizations, you know, is left with, you know, relatively a small amount of money. And, wow. you know, I, I often think about why are we not raising this um, as an issue within the art sector more, mm -hmm. not just nationally, but locally. Um, you know, I think that this is an important conversation to have, especially as we're going through an economic, um, well, recession, I wouldn't say disaster, but recession um, is maybe well, the word <laughs> I'm supposed to be using. Um, you know, when like, frankly, this is the time that a lot of institutions are probably going to be pivoting and thinking about or rethinking, I would think, um, you know, some policies, guidelines, and other things. Um, so, like, when we look at this this slide, for example, we can start to see that, like, this is for the St. Louis MSA, which is a 16-county area in St. Louis and Illinois. Um, but, you know, you can see pretty quickly that, like, 57.6% uh, um, of all of total revenue went to 1% of organizations with 10 million, uh, with budgets of $10 million or more. Well, you know, organizations um, with budgets of less than $100,000, which make up 82% of all arts nonprofits um, in the MSA, they only had 2.6% of uh, total revenue. And if you go to slide number two, um, the same thing is true for if you look at assets, which is another big, um, another big indicator um, of how wealth is distributed, mm -hmm. like you see a lot of the same stuff. Um, and actually, Rick, do you mind going to slide number three? I don't want to, um, the other way we can look at this too is by discipline, by artistic discipline. And we can start to see like, essentially who is, has compared to their, the number, um, like, you know, performing arts institutions, for example, make up 33.6% of all the arts nonprofits, yet they receive almost 10% more, um, of, of total revenue mm -hmm. um you can kind of start to get the sense and i'm not saying that this is like the end all be all um of how to look at funding equity it's rather like this i think is like a place to start in terms of like you know asking questions um about the relationship between size and discipline um the study i referenced earlier made a pretty strong argument that eurocentric performing arts institutions um are have you know frankly enjoyed philanthropic support from elites since like, oh Lord, 1880s. Um, and so we're really like living essentially the, the decisions <laughs> that have been made by elites over the past hundred years in terms of like what arts organizations are really, really big right now mm. and how much power they have. Um, yeah, in the chat, uh, Denise says, information is power. Liz is bringing the receipts. This is savage. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Um, and the math. I was going to say, yeah. we, we're just going to know we didn't yeah, let sure. everyone yeah. know that math was coming. Oh, it no. didn't happen. Here it is. It's a graph. Get over it. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I apologize for all the math. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Not at all. This is this is the hard data we need for sure. And it, and it gives us a good, it gives us something good to, um, to focus on and, and, and to not just conjecture about. I think that like conjecturing about this kind of thing it, it's one thing when we have a visual artist on and we're talking about you know th the color blue right and it's it's a, a completely subjective experience but like you know to just make broad sweeping statements about these kinds of things out of a place of like anger which is valid but also being able to connect these to um, tangible uh, 
uh, you know, tangible data. Um, Boogie Nights in the chat, welcome. Hey, good to see you, Boogie. Uh, seeing and questioning the distribution of money throughout organizations for quite some time. This is so fulfilling to see this breakdown. Um, so, so again, just that question about like, is this real? Like, is this a sense that we have because, you know, we're broke and we are angry at people with money? Or is this like an actual, you know, f like structural way that our uh, communities oh, and man. things are being built, right? Yeah, because I think that like the systems have been built to make you angry. <laughs> yeah. Like as individual artists, like, how much has the system been built to benefit you in all reality other than philanthropic grants which yeah that's great but like you know again in other in other societies it's not philanthropy that's supporting supporting artists it's taxes it's more sustainable means hmm. um and so I, I think about that a lot i think about you know the construction of our system in america and and how much it's decentered the artist uh, within the arts and culture sector itself hmm. mm -hmm couple more ch things from the chat here and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive back into our conversation. Um, how can we disrupt if no one's brave enough to tell the truth or to collect the data? Um, and uh, Gregory Stevens says, I think artists are afraid to speak up because we might not be heard or even such institutions might try to do things to keep us, to keep us down. And also the connection between um, this and work and health and job, uh, says Skate Mom. So um, oh man, there's all, so much there. Very valid points there. Uh, this is the point where I'm going to live up to the rant. Um, Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I want to say first and foremost that I think it's a really good question about how you disrupt these systems. Mm -hmm. I think that unfortunately, like throughout the history um, of arts funding in America, it's you know we have a really strong power dynamic between funder and grantee. And I think that in a lot of ways, it's you know worked to the benefit of the funder for a very, very long time. Um, and I think that, you know, frankly, the the power in disruption comes from working collectively. Um, and I think that I think about something someone told me who worked at a local arts funder. She said, "I cannot believe that local artists aren't out on the streets in front of our building every day, demanding more, demanding." more services, demanding more money, demanding more, you know, you name it. And that really stuck with me. I think that like, it's really interesting to think that we often think about art as political but in terms of being political, acting in political ways in the arts um, sector is actually really not normalized at all. You know, like how often are you like, you know what, I'm gonna go protest at city hall for more arts funding for a cultural plan for, you know, we don't really think yeah. about acting in those ways because to be honest, like there is a history of artists and other people who do try and be political within the art sector of being punished by funders or being punished by government. Um, and I think that that's really led to, you know, um, led to us not necessarily thinking about participating in those ways and frankly not being rewarded for participating in those ways for a really long time. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't and happen. I'm... Right. And I also imagine too that um, those who are uh, that protest in those ways and then are, are still funded anyway, the the lizard people that host that have the, <laughs> this this uh, if I, I I can I can be axed for that. You don't have to say I'll say it, so you don't have to, Liz. Uh, that oftentimes if it looks like they're giving leeway in a good way, like oh wow, they're like finally coming around, they're doing the right thing. That oftentimes that's because benefits them in some way that it's it's only because it benefits them not necessarily because they finally saw the light um you know and and this is a much more broad conversation but and maybe not one i can fully speak on but it's certainly one i've been very suspect of uh whenever major corporations have kind of in, embraced groups such as like black lives matter or other ones um that you know on the surface it does have the promotional uh, they're using their money for technically a pragmatically a good thing that it is being shown on, you know, on the NBA courts, like it says Black Lives Matter. That is important. That is something. But oftentimes, you know, well, what does the NBA gain to benefit from doing that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that maybe is a whole other conversation, but just to broaden cheap, that scope uh, for those maybe who aren't. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, and for those maybe watching who aren't as familiar with like artist spaces, like, you know, these are these obviously happen in every way, shape and form, regardless of where. Uh, these these positions of power and, and finance happen for sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's very true. And I, I think that that's a real, real power move to be able to co-opt that message and be able to use it for your own benefit. Right. Like they, they, they are totally flexing when they do that. Like, yeah. you know, we're going to be relevant and maintain essentially our power because the way we can do that is by throwing you a couple, whatever the donation is that they're going to make it doesn't mean right. that they're going to change their practices internally. It doesn't, you know, it's like the most, um, unsatisfying <laughs> like surface level shit you can do to like make people be quiet well and Absolutely. i, I want to build a bridge from that to this idea of um giving in the arts so i think that there's this idea that like the arts are meant to be given to and and that there's the, it's like and i i know you probably have much different definitions of these words than me but th what it, how it feels like for me is that like art you know, like supporting art is like giving, not funding. And like, there's this idea of like, oh, I'm a better person because I'm uh, a member of the St. Louis Art Museum, which like I am, and I do think I am. But I, I don't know if there's anything in that where there's, there's kind of this tent of like giving versus like actively participating um, or like uh, the other point of like, it shouldn't require giving like it should be funded it should be um valued intrinsically in like our society and and separating those ideas yeah yeah that makes me think of two different things the first is that like yeah i am a member of like basically every arts institution i can be in st louis because i believe in them and i want to support them um, I think that there's a real, you know, in, in America, I think that we've, I've mentioned this before. Um, I think it's really interesting. And when I say America, I'm also like reflecting upon the local level as well. Mm -hmm. Like this incorporates how St. Louis works. Um, is that, you know, our systems are set up so that, you know, philanthropy is the answer um, to a lot of pretty much, you know, is, is a huge reason uh, funding mechanism for arts institutions and as, as is individual giving um, and I think that something that's really important here is I think there's this idea in uh, political science of social construction like what is the social construction of artists um, or art even um, in our society it is so much different than I think you know if you look at other western European countries or other countries that fund the arts through taxes as opposed through primarily through philanthropy and I think the idea there is like, there is this idea of artists as being dependent and deviant, which I think really puts them mm -hmm. um, at the periphery of our society, right? Like, um, I, you know, if we were to really center on artists, I think that we wouldn't be talking about their instrumental benefit, which is like, oh man, artists are great. They put so much in the economy and they can teach kids things. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But like, if I'm being honest, a lot of other sectors can make the argument about economic impact. You know, mm -hmm. what makes the arts unique is that um, there's emotions and feelings and like, you know, this idea of social cohesion has been really big lately around what art can do. And if those things are important to us, then why do we continue to fund them in a way that is um, frankly unreliable, um, insufficient, um, that frankly is trying to like more so privatize, I think, than make public uh, these responsibilities, uh, responsibilities as in, you know, funding these different artists or arts institutions. Um, and, you know, if we really wanted to sit back and look at these systems, I would argue that, you know, this is true of all philanthropy, um, that really it's a byproduct of capitalism. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, we're living through a second golden age of philanthropy right now because we're also living through extreme wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes the more people make, uh, the more they'll give away. And frankly, that's not a sustainable model for funding the arts, especially if we consider it. I think the other social construction piece of this is that, you know, artists have been defined as dependent um, and frankly, like are not very positively socially constructed in our society. Mm -hmm. um, but the other part of it too, is that I think art has really been defined as this like elitist siloed thing. And yeah, getting to it might make you feel warm and fuzzy, but for the most part, um, it's really upholding, you know, these inequitable systems that are incredibly biased. 
Yeah. And is that enough for you? And then, <laughs> and that's like, keep it coming. <laughs> there's like, uh, the, you know, then we get into what, what you said of like artists being seen as like deviant and then the, 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 the morality of capitalist giving, like the morality of philanthropy is like inextricably tied to that giving, like which institutions and organizations fit like per the perfect morality to go on uh, a hidden sitemap page of charitable giving for one of these massive tech companies. Like, you know, where, where do they align best in the morality of, of this particular oligarch or centibillionaire or uh, other things that I'm getting from the chat when, when like these deviant dependent artists are, as Denise says, needing GoFundMe's for medical bills, right? Yeah, that's fucking <laughs> bullshit, right? <laughs> so the, someone the, had to say it. <laughs> that morality inside of that philanthropy is, and I think that that's a sticky subject inside of like art as a public good. But it's also like a really, really Im important thing to talk about. And I don't know if we're getting too far away from the local level, but I think that it really does apply. No, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to the local level. Um, and I want to say really quickly that like in the arts too, there is like a perversion even within philanthropy itself of who is, who is worthy. And that is to say that like in the arts, we artistic merit and quality are often given um, the highest consideration in funding. And oftentimes when you look at other philanthropal, philanthropal, made up a word, mm. uh, thrill, philanthropic sectors, uh, like any social services, it's based on need, right? So like artists have to make um, their argument for why they are worth funding based on artistic quality, which is oftentimes very Eurocentric, mm. um, as opposed to like, you could look at any other sector where they're like, actually, who needs the money? Um, and that's not based on artistic merit at all. So I think that there's also like these really weird things that happen um, within that have developed and, you know, really rule the art sector as they don't um, other sectors as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I, 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 I don't know. I just I, I totally <laughs> agree. I, I think that yeah. the thing that really caught me was also, you know, like morality has so many many different definitions and that that specific reality of that definition of of the morality of the eurocentrism and you know like the ethnocentrism of philanthropy is like i i wasn't even i was just thinking of like in general terms of like you know sh smearing shit on a canvas for a good reason or or like vulgarity and like nudity or pornography but i i mean even more so than that like the intense like ethnocentrism of the the whiteness in the art you know and 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 that being that being a divisor yeah and but you can see that in terms of policy outputs right like who has the most sure. money actually iraq released um regional arts commission released a report two years ago now like they're going through their cultural planning and they hired a very well-known independent researcher who found that St. Louis has more larger arts institutions than like comparable sectors. And also that we have no black led arts institutions with budgets over $1 million. Wow. And those are very scary things. Like while generally speaking across the country, we don't look that inequitable. Frankly, inequity is pretty common in the arts sector, no matter where you go. We fit right those two in. Things are specific. It's good to we fit, fit in. right in. I love right? fitting in. <laughs> Um, but those are those are real things for St. Louis, especially I think when you think about, you know, how representative that is of our population. Mm. Um, and it really, you know, I think you can start to connect. What I'm really interested in is kind of twofold. One is being able to connect um, criteria like policy grant criteria, policy eligibility to these larger policy outcomes. Um, I think that that's, you know, making those connections is is pretty important to be able to understand the impact of our funding systems on the landscape um, because there are there is um, systematic these results aren't these results are intentional they are part of their outputs of a system right like there is a reason these things exist mm -hmm. that we have so much inequity uh, so we have to go back and ask why and what is you know really the mechanism for making those things possible mm. And I policy centered, oh, but go ahead, Jay. Sorry, um, I, I recall going to um, a talk uh, that was presented by the Art City Defenders um, 
that basically kind of just talked about like basically the the city budget and how it's set up and and you know how little is is put towards like social services but yet how much is put towards uh policing and things of that nature uh and the the staggering data of you know how long one bar was compared to the other and i think how you know social services was certainly like very minute compared to like like 100 versus one something equivalent to that size and i think that you know when those numbers look pretty darn similar to the ones that we're seeing right now up, up on the screen um it, you know i think that if nothing else like we don't need to draw you know comparisons that's just like just show us the data you know and i think that maybe the re like on top of the reasons why the data isn't collected is because we don't want y'all to know that <laughs> mm -hmm. you yeah. know it's so much that it's it's not so much that you know again there's this like it feels like it is it sounds like it is but i let's look at the data and then of course inevitably it looks exactly the same in terms of how these things happen and uh i'm sure one of us was going to say this idea this this phrase as this often does come up is you know uh the, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools so if you are having to do it on your own and on your own reconnaissance and frankly i think you know in in terms of academia liz like what you're doing with this i think 100 percent bats away at, at at these uh uh, these inequities and this need and uh, Rick I just have to say uh, I was thinking about the travel agency it's like you're beholden to literally no one mm -hmm. you know like to make this profile like we have to go out and do it ourselves mm -hmm. which is incredible and wonderful in the culture of DIY however um, it also feels like you know I think what we're bumping up against too is like well why won't I just be given money why won't i why won't we value these things you know it's not just so much that the data there that shows that we don't value it it's also the why we don't value it yeah give and, me a little you know, seed I, money somebody yeah <laughs> just like a little just a little ubi just for like a, a brief moment to make to see if this works or not right just yeah. just a little pittance toss me a coin out of your pocket because <laughs> it's really all it is in, in the said. scope of yeah. that like to to make it work and and i'll take this opportunity to say you know with with our with our resident artists and the fundraising that we'll be doing it like twitch is like a data centered a data centric platform so like we are able to leverage data and collect data on every residency and package that data in a way that's appropriate to artists to see like the effectiveness of their project within the larger scope of the travel agency and we can set certain metrics you know and and it and it's good because I think that some organizations will like the la the level of data metrics that we can produce and provide. But but um, I think that that's like really important as as a way of like giving place and space to artists is understanding impact. And that's not to say that it doesn't have intrinsic value. But you can you can combine those elements into efficacy. Um, and and I will just note for the sake of uh, sort of NPR style uh, thing, uh, Twitch is owned by Amazon. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Despite, despite all of the amazing things we just said and the tools that Twitch does actually bequeath to you incredibly so, uh, this this is owned it's by Amazon. An Twitch. analytics surveillance tool. Which sucks, but, you know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, but then uh, then that brings us to policy. And I think that brings us to one of, one of the core. Okay, sorry, sorry. Y'all are there? Yeah, one, one second. I You can hear me. They can't hear you, though. Correct. But I couldn't hear. Yeah, just one second. I think everything briefly broke. Hey, y'all, we're just going to take a quick little break here. We'll be right back when we get this technical issue sorted out.
A hundred percent. No, we can't. We can use data to understand how horrible systems are. Yeah, <laughs> how horrible institutions are. And and yeah, it's. Um, I think it's also like there's a lot. Yeah, I think you're right. A lot more interest in like ownership. In, yeah. In those things. Oh, hey, Rick. Hello. did it we're back uh let me just quickly um you know everything just breaks all at once sometimes like literally two things broke at the same time uh my audio interface and discord just both like took a dump so now that they're clean and clear and under control welcome back y'all um hello thank you i think that uh, the consensus in chat is um we said bad things about very important people that there's yeah, some sort of did. audio filtering Amazon Alexa app that is uh, that's ruining us. Definitely. The overlords are always listening, so. <laughs> um, but yes, I think that everyone can hear you all. Let me just make. Oh, Liz, could you say something for our producer? Oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. Hi, producer. That should be, hey, that you? should be fine. No, Tiffany is the. Oh. The producer behind the producer. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's people I didn't even know. Yeah, there's like a little here? glass room <laughs> that we, I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you all okay. for sticking around, hanging out. Um, we were just getting into this, uh, the beginnings of this um, policy discussion. Or, I mean, not really the beginnings, but we were getting to this point where we were talking about policy. And... Um, Importantly, you know, in, in some of our first conversations, when you're saying like, you know, lobbying for artist rights or, or having people involved like arts in the conversation with our uh, public officials and, and, and like that just like did not compute with me at all. It's like, you know, was, I, I didn't hear Bernie Sanders say anything about uh, about like more fun. I mean, he probably did, but the, the loudest and most outspoken person and supporting like community action and on the presidential level in a long time. I, I don't remember a sound bite of Bernie saying like, you know, make artists great again or whatever. Um, Definitely the language he would have used. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but in our, in our conversations, you were bringing up that like, that there can be a relationship there. That can be something that artists consider is politicians, officials who, consider them people and consider the work that they do valuable. Yeah. And I would say are able to appreciate and work with all aspects of their personhood. Right. Because like being an artist is one aspect of your personhood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important to make policy around that. But I think it's also important to recognize that artists, for example, make a whole lot less than other, other professions. Um, and if we consider them valuable to our society, and that probably means we need to talk about healthcare. It probably means we need to talk about minimum wage. We probably need to talk about a lot of other things that relate to art, like really to artists, but frankly mm -hmm. to lots of other people as well. Like they are both connected um, to and within, you know, you know, the arts. And I think that, you know, frankly, people have been able to keep art off the agenda, whether we're talking about the local political agenda or the national agenda because they've been able to characterize um, art as being for elites. They characterize it as artists being these dependent deviants, right? Mm -hmm. Not as necessarily productive members of society as, I'm, as I think other people um, who are much more undeserving of that title get. Um, and I think it's because artists are seen as oftentimes being less powerful, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think that it's really a point in time where we need to reckon with with this. Uh, I think particularly at the local at the local level, we have a mayoral election coming up, um, 
And I think it's time for the arts to be on the agenda um, beyond what can the arts do um, for St. Louis in terms of like tourism or economics. Like, yeah, sure, we can have that conversation. But I'm happy to, but like, let's also have the conversation as well about, how, you know, if that, if artists are valued and if you value cultural tourism, you value these other things, then you probably need to value artists having healthcare and you probably need to value childcare and all these other things that are, you know, 100% impacting artists. Hmm. Yeah, the broadening of that, I think, is is um, important for us to think about. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very uh, privileged in a lot of what I have as, as a resource to make art and, um, you know, as far as, like, life, being able to live and sustain myself through through means. So often, you know, it, it's, a, it's a helpful reminder to challenge those ideas when it comes to other people who are making work, other people who would love to be artists but don't find any infrastructure there to support them. Is you, I mean, you can't do it if you don't have environmental support. I, we see that time and time again with, with artists on art brunches. Is it like the environment, the environmental support, even like from an early age often, but as, as they grow into schools and institutions, that environmental support is just, is pivotal for them. And I think it'd be an even, sorry, more basic level, like, I think that there's a lot of lessons people learn about who is and is not an artist very early on. Yeah. Like, you know, if we consider artists to be people who can self-support or self-sustain um, or have the means to like, or the privilege to be able to do what we consider art, um, then I think we have a pretty, um, a pretty small definition of art and we're thinking about art pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we make that more inclusive? And I, I, I think, you know, that really limits cultural participation and, and delegitimizes um, a lot of people out there who probably very well are, art art, are artists. They just, they haven't constructed ways in which they can see themselves as artists. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, it, under, it undermines our community organization like to get kind of far away from the point real quick is is that like deconstructing community ritual and deconstructing like collaborative community creativity i mean is is like who benefits from that and i think that there are answers to that question and yeah and what yeah. i may say and just this is a this would be a rant that i would like to go on but i'm not going to but i will keep to this is like something i've been trying to think about like the arts uh, as a public health uh, issue, um, and and maybe in some ways specifically public art um, as a as a government funded good um, that you know if we can highly fund public art um, you know why why stop there and go and fund the the artists of our community as well um, that those going hand in hand uh, you know the public health of of something or of a community is kind of everything we're talking about. It's it's not just the physical well being, but also the societal well being. And if you are feeling good and you are funded and you are, have a home and you're able to have you know intercommunal um, meetings and feel that you're heard and that there's power that like you want to create art. You know, like it it fun it fuels the joy of this, the the love, the the friendships, the the partnerships that you're able to form. Um, and, and again, as like a public good um, beyond all of that. And um, that's that's something I, I've certainly been thinking a lot about is kind of the, uh, someone had to use the word intersection um, of, you know, like kind of arts and public health in those spaces. Um, and especially, uh, at least for me, uh, funding something like Medicare for All uh, would be deeply important and would, would absolutely lend itself to that of uh, funding arts and arts communal uh, prospects. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Sorry, I said I wasn't going to go on a read, but yeah. I kind of did. So. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. And Me too, Liz. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to read a few messages from the chat, and we're going to take our next break, if that's okay with you all. So, um, so yeah, Skate Mom says, all of that struggle is a shame because the world depends on art to move and to exist. Um, Denise says, heart and soul, physical and mental health is intertwined. And there is no graphic artists without drawing. There's no TV shows without drama. You know, it's, I mean, we can, yeah. we see it everywhere. Isn't it, it's crazy that we like value the product so much, but we don't value the, 
the people behind it. Like, yeah, right. I don't think that's a really sad thing. Well, um, we're going to leave you there and yeah. uh, in a space to, to we're contemplate We're going to leave on a sad that. note. <laughs> time to <laughs> contemplate. Well, and I'm going to switch over. Switching over here. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, chat, you all have been killing it today. Uh, really, really great um, pace and cadence and adding things to the conversation. So thank you, chat. Thank you for... Uh, really helping this make a great art brunch today. Um, we're going to take a short break for 10 minutes. You can expect us back here again at about 1213, where we'll wrap up our conversation with, um, with Liz about policy. And then we'll move into everyone's not so favorite, favorite section, 10 questions of triumph. And then we will let you all get on with your day. Greg, no, thank you. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for hanging out across the break. I hope you had time to pop some popcorn or uh, make another pot of coffee and subsequently like drink that other pot of coffee. Um, speaking of mugs, uh, we have eight mugs left, eight travel agency mugs left on the website. You can go check out our website here. Uh, they're $17.50 with free shipping. If you're interested in getting one of the eight remaining travel agency mugs, um, go try that. They, t they, they work well. They're very mug-like. <laughs> We're going to get back into the show here and uh, start with a slide that um, Liz requested we show everyone. So we will start here with this if it's a little hard to read the text. The title of the, uh, of the slide is Cultural Public Charities by Size and Median Household Income 2015. Uh, trigger warning, there's math <laughs> involved in this slide. Yeah, um, it's all you, so you math, like one of my math lords out there. Get ready, pen and paper. Pen and paper. Um, so I, I kind of, I wanted to build off of what we were talking about before we left about the idea of community and policy. Um, and I think that sometimes it's really helpful to like see where arts and culture nonprofits are. So this is St. Louis City and County. Um, and essentially what I've mapped out is household median income. Which, um, it gets darker green, the more money uh, people have. Um, and then I've also plotted out uh, the size of arts nonprofits um, and where they're located in St. Louis City and County. And something I think about a lot is obviously the physical uh, location, because I think that when we're talking about community, we're talking about um, who has voice and who might be concerned about policy. Um, a lot of times it's dependent upon, you know, how closely, uh, what kind of relationship you have uh, with an arts nonprofit and how you interact with them. Um, and, you know, we know through, through theory that like, arts and culture nonprofits tend to be centralized um, and cities tend to be near universities. Um, and so like what we're seeing is not atypical at all. Um, but I think that it starts to raise a whole lot of questions because like, for example, there are no large arts nonprofits um, like North in North St. Louis, you know, or in far South St. Louis, um, you know, and we can certainly, I think one of my pet peeves is we often um, a lot of, Arts nonprofits or other people will, you know, will like, who's your audience? And they'll be like, well, everyone is. And I'm like, hmm, is that, is that true though? Like if you're located, you know, in whatever zip code you're located in, are you really serving one that's like 50 miles away? Probably, probably not. Um, in theory, you would like to, but probably not. Um, and so I think that this starts to get to me to the idea of uh, the dynamics between who we are as a population in St. Louis City and County um, the arts nonprofits um, and our relationships to arts nonprofits, both in terms of size and location. Um, and it's pretty clear that like, you know, if you're interested in talking about arts nonprofits, you're gonna be talking about like a very small part of St. Louis city and county in terms of physical location. Like, yes, people can travel to them. Um, yes, they might have outreach programs that go to other places, 
but I think it matters a whole lot about where they are located, you know, like their physical location matters. Mm. And I think you can really start to see that, like, for lack of a better word, there are some nonprofit arts deserts out there, right? Like, mm. there are some places where, like, there really isn't a whole lot going on. And, you know, that's not unrelated um, a lot of times to, like, household medium income or other things. Um, I think that, you know, when I start to think about the mayoral election that's coming up, and I start to think about getting, you know, the arts on the agenda, um, I think about this map because it makes me think about like who's going to be likely to show up or who will not be showing up if we talk about um, arts and cultural policy. Um, and it really makes me think that like, you know, it's going to be likely that like artists really need to be the forerunners um, of making political demands, especially in the upcoming mayoral election or really be active um, in terms of organization, uh, because there are a lot of folks out there who, frankly, as, as citizens, as audience members or participants, however you want to talk about them, like, they're frankly just not included. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that uh, artists in particular, arts administrators, um, and people who do, you know, who are supporters or patrons, um, you know, really need to be leading um, well, I should say that they're most likely to lead the conversation. Do they need to be leading it? I don't know. They probably need to be sharing that responsibility. Um, but I think it's the idea that like, we can start to see that there are some real dynamics in St. Louis that are influencing who does and does not have access um, to arts nonprofits. And you know, when I start to think about this policy question, it makes me think about who's going to turn up when we start to talk about um, what arts policy looks like on the agenda. Um, I think that we need to consider inclusivity and representation, of course. Um, but also, you know, we need to deal with the reality that, you know, as much as location matters and as much as size matters, I think we're also in this really crazy time where some of those things have don't matter as much, right? Because uh, we don't really live in a time right now where physical location <laughs> matters maybe as much as it used to when you can't even go to um, I would say probably something like 60% or 50% um, of these arts nonprofits. Um, you can't go to their physical location right now. Um, so this is both to say like, while these things are strong, some of these things have also really been cut off for the time being, especially for the mayoral election. Mm. It also makes me think that like a lot of sectors right now are making some really strong cases um, about why they need to be um, on the political agenda. And frankly, like, I don't, think anyone has a better case than arts and culture. Um, whether we're talking about um, arts nonprofits or music venues or artists, like, you know, we don't have quantitative studies. I am using my gut right now to some extent. Um, well, I should, um, let me backpedal on that because I, <laughs> I definitely have researched this. Um, we do know right now that like, as of October, I want to say like 46 percent um, of artists reported not having um, enough savings to pay for basic needs by 2021. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what other industries look like but that's a pretty staggering number um, and it really makes me think that you know as we move into this mayoral election it's not just about getting the arts on the agenda, but getting the arts on the agenda because there is extreme need right now. Um, and that there are a whole lot of, yes, nonprofit institutions, but I would argue more so artists um, who are experiencing circumstances they may not have ever experienced before in their lives. And frankly, they don't have the means because of the systems around them um, a lot of times to weather the storm. It seems to me like a lot of people are talking about, um, like, notably on, uh, like, uh, forcing a vote sort of uh, in in the national scale for this to be an opportunity to get Medicare for all on uh, on the on the docket. And uh, a lot of people are saying, no, 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 take the time, get make the shake the hands, like, get in the back rooms, do what you can't infiltrate, quote unquote. When really it's kind of just, I, I, again, this is my opinion, not saying this is the way it is, but that. Um, a lot of people see there's immense value in just kind of like, well, everything's double bad now. You know, it's not just that arts funding was already bad. Now we have an opportunity to not only fund artists out of need, out of necessity, which was always there, but it's extremely, it's, 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 it's clear now 
how how the ne the necessity has been i think in the world um and for us to take our little chunk of the pie here to say that you know artists are those people too and that what better time as an opportunity as things are reduced and being refocused that we can kind of frankly shove through do whatever we can to make that be on the docket when in other times uh they can kind of use the sort of um uh, everyday life of stuff to be like, well, that's not something we really talk about. We've got a lot of other stuff to deal with. Well, now everything's on the table. I like to think this is an opportunity to rethink these things, um, especially, you know, and, and yes, it is a crisis, but it is absolutely an opportunity to reshape these things, uh, both, I think, locally, statewide, nationally, for sure. Yeah, um, you're actually, so my dissertation is about agenda setting and issue framing within the arts. Wow. And so you're like, tapping into something that we talk about a lot in agenda setting, which is the ICs actually present really important opportunities to get things on the agenda. But oftentimes it takes a crisis in order to shake up the existing systems enough and move away from the status quo um, to be able to create policy change. Now, oftentimes it goes with um, a couple of other things in terms of like, you can talk about how um, big the conflict is, i.e. like how many people are involved, the more people that become involved often also increases the chance for policy change. So that's where the collective action piece comes in. I don't think that it can be, um, you know, a singular person talking about um, the arts in St. Louis City and County. It needs to be a pretty broad coalition of folks. And I wanna shout out to Citizen Artists St. Louis, who in the last mayoral election was a group of really wonderful um, artists, arts practitioners, arts administrators, you name it, a really broad swath of people came together to organize um, a mayoral debate, make sure that each mayoral candidate addressed the arts. Um, and I thought that that was a really powerful moment where you know it was kind of, to my knowledge, and again, I, I don't I have a short lifespan, um, is you know one of the few times in St. Louis where that's really, you know, that art and politics have really intersected in that way before. Um, and I hope, yeah. that, I hope that it can happen again. That's amazing. Yeah, just an, an opportunity, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm happy to even hear hear about that and and understand, you know, for myself, like where to go, where to get involved. I see that they have a Facebook page here um, and a, a link to, uh, it seems like maybe yes. a face, Facebook page. And, I'm not sure. Um, maybe they're maybe it's still going I, I don't know but there there are resources and we can connect and um, share share some of those things through through the travel agency infrastructure as well so uh, keep an eye out for that because I mean it's hard to be the first one and and the most important one is the second one I think and a lot of a lot of ways it's like the first follower is is more important in a lot of ways than the person with the idea or the person you know with that's that's starting this kind of thing and and then we can all kind of pile on onto that if I want to, you know, be hopeful, Rick, at the moment, which I do. I like <laughs> being hopeful, Rick. But yeah. I love yeah. the idea of like lobbying for it. It's like government is, you know, for the people. I mean, like we're the ones that are supposed to have control over over what's going on. And and I I, th I think that the other point that I wanted to make is that creativity and innovation, community innovation is under attack right now. I mean, we can look at it through the restaurant industry of, uh, it's just like the clearest, most easy one to see is that innovation is going away and and what moves into, you know, what moves into that struggling restaurant's real estate when they go. And once you put a Boston market in there, it's never gonna not be a Boston market again, except the one on Clayton Road is no longer a Boston market, which is the only Boston market I've ever seen close. So wow. maybe there is possibilities for the future or that's indicative of how bad the crisis really is. Yeah. And something that, I mean, something that scares me a whole lot is, you know, there are well, a lot of the small arts and profits we see on this map won't be here mm -hmm. any longer um, after this year. Um, we're looking at a pretty high closure rate of arts and profits, especially the smallest ones, which to me are like, that's what gets me excited, like about studying arts and culture sector is the really small arts and profits organizations that um, I think are much more, they tend to be more community centered. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And I think about 
you know, what does it mean to, to have to lose those? Um, what does it mean to have no small arts, no profits in a lot of zip codes anymore? Um, that's a real, that's a real possibility. Um, and they're also like, I, as much as I hate to talk about this, but it's very true. Like a lot of these, um, arts nonprofits also are employers and they have canceled so many contracts that artists rely on. Um, it's like the number one thing that essentially arts nonprofits were doing to cut their expenses was cutting, um, any kind of like outside vendors. And that's a lot of times how artists are employed, not as full-time employees but is like 1099 part-time or hourly employees mm. absolutely mm -hmm. well and two i think just one more last thing for me on the um opportunity thing is that like in a lot of ways i think these artists and artist collectives like maybe did have something to lose at a time when you know the status quo was happening which is to say non uh plague times uh that you know they can kind of the the powers that be can use the status quo as as a as a means of defense basically and now it's like we are literally going to have to shut down which we were probably close to or always struggling with in status quo time but now it's like we literally need to fight so the i think the fierceness and the collective action that these groups can come together to hopefully make this happen while of course still bleeding you know and losing folks and losing patronage and losing funding as you know funding is is just is gone but at this time too i think it's an opportunity to kind of um, when you have nothing left to lose, we're already, it's like, we're, we're literally going to shut down, you know? So we need to jump into these spaces to where, um, we can, we can make our voices heard, you know, and, and, and basically grab land, do a, I do a, I do an, uh, a power grab in the sense of just like, we're in your face now and you have to deal with us. Uh, too brutal comes to mind. Yeah. Yes. That's, um, <laughs> yeah, I think like... brutal for sure. Uh, which just uh, briefly on that, just so everyone knows, that was Rick's uh, AIM handle. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the inside jokes, we want to keep everyone inside with us. So uh, B00BR00T4L. <laughs> so we're getting too brutal for sure. <laughs> um, the, last, the last thing I want to say too is I think this is an opportunity to reframe um, the arts at the local level, right? Like I feel, as I've said before, like I feel like, you know, the normative frame for like arts is outside of government and it's outside of because I think a lot of times it's framed as this like it's the you know it's this elitist thing that exists for certain people um it is not inclusive etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think this is a real chance to say and, and you know artists are essentially their support is privatized like I think it's a real chance to say no artists are part of society art is part of society and that doesn't mean museums that means you know these small community organizations are just as important yeah. um and i think that that's a really that's a really big piece of it and that's not easy work but it's it's lord's work it's yeah. it's it needs to happen shout out to them you know and shout out to the people that support them you know when they're not getting support from other places and these these communities that that we form and there's a lot of cool, I mean, a lot of power there, a lot of power there. And, and yeah, I like that. And they're doing, they're doing the work, you know, that's, it's like the infrastructure is these small organizations are, are so flexible and can adjust and stretch and dance in the ways that like their communities need them to dance. Um, I've got a few comments yeah. here in chat. Uh, Denise, says always a breakdown before a breakthrough get ready to imagine the world you want to le live in um and there was also a nice audible meow it was not virgil meowing it was liz's kitty meowing i believe uh gwen ginger says no question or comment just a big fan of liz and her work uh denise that's says, my sister <laughs> denise says she's an art queen for sure <laughs> gotta get the love from the mom there we go paying the mom, oh, tag. mom text paid. thanks Gwen thanks for coming to the stream Sam. today it's uh it's awesome to have you here and I don't know if you are ever on twitch but thanks for being here and being a part of our community today um we are going to move into our final segment which is the 10 questions of triumph I don't have a special video intro for that one yet uh, okay. <laughs> it, I, I, f I figured two would be too much to spring on Jake's spur of the moment. Um, oh, it's 
So yeah, next time, you. next time maybe we'll have we'll have a short video of me drinking a Bloody Mary out of like a large golden trophy or something. Uh, Here we go. And um, also, I wanted to ask the chat. You know, so um, Liz really is interested in answering your questions as well about the St. Louis art scene, about uh, St. Louis in institution and infrastructure in reference to the arts, and um, she's definitely capable of answering at least some of those questions probably has some insight on anything that you'd ask. So if you all have questions for Liz, now is the time to start feeding them into the chat and we'll kind of intersperse them with our uh, 10 silly questions uh, of triumph. Of triumph, yes. <laughs> okay. 